If you have your Bibles, and I pray you do, Ephesians 5, 22 through 24, and then we're also going to be looking at verses 32 and 33 of our text, Ephesians 5, 22 through 24, and then we'll also be looking at verses 32 and 33. Now remember, last week, man, we looked at uh, the call of God in this text to spiritually love our wives, lead our wives, and learn our wives. And this week, uh, we're going to look at at four things. We're going to notice the command that's given. Okay, we're going to notice the command that's given. Second, we're going to look at the focus required to carry out the command. Third, the privilege connected to the command. And fourth, the result of obeying the command. So we're going to look at the command given, ladies. We're going to look at the focus that's required or necessary to carry out the command. We're going to look at the privilege connected to the command and forth the result of obeying the command. Now, last week I started, and I want to again, Psalm 127, 1, one of my favorite verses, unless the Lord builds the house, and he's not talking about stone and brick and all that, except the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman keeps awake in vain. God is the architect of the home. In Genesis, he created the home when he created Adam and then Eve. God has the blueprints on how to make your home successful for his glory. It's called the Word of God. It's interesting as you study the New Testament how few passages deal with husbands and wives specifically. Ephesians got something, Colossians, but mostly what you'll find in the New Testament are the principles about how to live for Jesus Christ. And if you'll follow those principles, it'll take care of the home. You understand that? Like if we practice agape love and we see verses four through seven, the attributes uh, of agape love, think of your home and think how radically changed your home would be if you just loved like that. And then we looked at Matthew 7, 24 through 27, which I think is one of the linchpin scriptures of all the Bible. Jesus, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, I don't know that there's much more powerful a word that Jesus says to humanity than this right here when he says, therefore, this is Jesus speaking, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, you know what you're going to hear today? His words, okay? Because all the word is his words. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man or a woman who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell. And by the way, did you notice it's not if it falls? The rain falls on the just and the unjust, the Bible says. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house. And yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and it fell and great was its fall. And I asked you last week and if I asked you again this week, what is the key to this? And you'd say maybe the rock or don't build on the sand. But the key to this text is acting or not acting on the words of God. If you act, you'll be counted as a wise man, building on rock, who is Christ. And when the storms of life come, because listen to me, child of God, you are not exempt from the storms of life. They hit our lives just like they hit lost people's lives. Christians get cancer. Christians lose jobs. Christians go through all kinds of uh, horrible stuff just like the lost do. But the difference is, because we're obedient children of God following the teachings of Christ, when those storms come, our house does not fall apart. Trudy and I have had many a storm over the 40 years. But we knew the key was to get on our knees before God and pray it out, read it out, and act it out. There is no other way. It's what we're called to do. And so I just wanted you to see that one more time. Jesus said, if you want to be wise, 
Act on his teachings. That means do them. It means, in some translations, it means to practice them. Well, let me ask you, how's your word time? You can't practice what you don't know. Would you agree with that? You cannot practice what you don't know. And how do you start to know? By making sure that daily you have word time so that you can put into your heart the word of God, as the psalmist says, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a light and lamp unto my feet and path. How, uh, the psalmist goes on saying, Psalm 119, how does a young man keep his way pure? By obeying your statutes, by obeying your teachings. When Joshua was going to lead the, people, the children of Israel into the promised land, what did God give him? He gave him one thing. Don't deviate from the left or the right of all that my servant Moses gave. Because Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. And, 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 and what God was telling Joshua, you want to be successful? Obey me. And if you'll obey me, I'll bless everywhere you go. And then you get into Joshua in chapter 7, and they chose not to obey and they got whooped pretty bad in a battle, a skirmish. And they came back to the camp with their tails tucked. And you know what God said to Joshua? Don't cry to me. There's sin in the camp. You've got to eradicate it. And so they found the one that had taken part of the treasure that God said don't take. He had buried it under his tent. It was discovered. He and his family were taken out and stoned to death. That's how serious God is about sin. Jesus said it. He said, if your right hand offend thee, cut it off. If your right eye offend thee, gouge it out. We have to be getting serious about sin. And we're really good at other people's sin, aren't we? I mean, we can put people on blast in social media in a minute. Did you hear what you did? You, you know, where you should look is your own life first. So two weeks ago... I gave you the movement of the world when I preached on Ephesians 5, 21. And I had said that if you look and study what's going on in the world, here's where the world is headed. You ready? The world encourages everyone to stand up for his or her rights. Is that not true? And by the way, what's right for me might not be right for you. Isn't that, don't you hear that? Because we're all our own gods. Ladies, the feminist movement promotes women's rights. Nothing wrong with equal pay for equal work. Nothing wrong with that at all. But in the midst of that, they begin to separate the wives from their husbands. The homosexual movement promotes so-called gay rights. Some advocate children's rights to be free from parental authority. We in California and some states, they're literally saying they're going to arrest parents if the parents don't let these kids mutilate their bodies. They're going to arrest the parent. PETA promotes animal rights, sometimes over and above human rights. And if you think your rights have been violated, you can easily find a lawyer who will take your case to court, and you may win a ridiculous huge settlement because we sue everybody. So the world's way is what? Assert yourself. Life is about me. At the center of the message of the world, life is about me, the individual. Stand up for your rights. Assert yourself. You don't have to take that. Get an attorney. Fight for your rights. And yet here in God's word, we're about to find out God's way is submit to one another in the fear of Christ. And these views are the polar opposites of that. We are bombarded, folks. Like, I'm going to say some things today, ladies, that maybe you've never heard. And you might find yourself tensing up on the inside, if not the outside. And while I'm preaching this, you might begin to formulate why you disagree with me. And if you do all that, you're going to miss what God wants you to know. Look, I got on the men last week, equal time. I love you. I once said I love all women, and then I found out probably shouldn't say that. But I do love all women like I love all men. I love all children. 
And I believe loving someone well is telling the truth. I do not want my doctor to love me in such a way that he doesn't let me know what my issues are. I cannot fix what I don't know is broken. And neither can you. So let's look at our text, Ephesians 5, 22 through 24. And we start with this. Paul writes, wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. The first thing I want to see in this text is the command. By the way, it's not a suggestion. It's a command. Paul wrote it, but it was under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It is a command that God has given, and the command is simply for this. Look, look at verse 22. Wives, be subject to your own husbands. Not every husband, your own husband. Subject is defined to relinquish one's rights, the willing submitting of oneself. So ladies, don't forget that. So as we talk, you need to operate from that definition. It's to relinquish one's rights, the willing submitting of oneself. Notice that Paul declares to the extent this subjection should take place. Notice verse 24. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands. And how many things? Everything in the Greek? Everything. Now, when do we stop that? When and if what the husband is asking out of us, out of you ladies, is sinful. And then you go with God, not your husband. Amen. And that's important to remember. And ladies, you won't know what's sinful and what's not if you're not in the Word of God. John MacArthur says about this command, and I quote, he says, this command is not qualified by her husband's intelligence. Are you listening, ladies? Okay. This command is not qualified by her husband's intelligence, character, attitude, spiritual condition, or any other consideration. The submission is to be a voluntary response to God's will in giving up one's independent rights to a wife's own husband. And Trudy said, I, I, she asked me if I had said, Last week I said, if you're single in this building right now, listen up. If you're a single woman in this building, listen up. Because when you say, I do before God, this is going to apply to you. And if you've picked a man because he's cute or he's funny or he gets me, or he's got a cool car or lots of money, you won't be very long into that marriage before you're miserable if you're a Christian. Because you're going to submit yourself to a man that doesn't love Jesus. And you're going to submit yourself to a man that doesn't love Jesus. And if he doesn't love Jesus, he's not going to love you well. Physical intimacy will only take you so far. So please listen up. Moms and dads, you need to be teaching your kids this stuff. What should a young lady look for in a man? Because remember this, moms and dads, she's got to submit to that man. And you ought to be teaching them what to look for. Nothing wrong with marrying someone cute. Trudy did. But, oh, I'm... I just wanted to see if you were listening. And thank you for the amen. Some of you meant them. There's nothing wrong with marrying a guy that gets you. One of the things I always ask single people when they're dating someone new, I ask them every time I say this, does he or she love Jesus? You know what I get back from people that are in church every week? 
I don't know. And then I say, yes, you do. Because if he's not talking about Jesus while he's with you, he does not love Jesus. Because God's called me to love Jesus more than Trudy. And I talk about Trudy all the time, so why would I not talk about Jesus with a perspective date? And men are dogs. Can we just be real? Lost men for sure, and unfortunately some Christians. Ladies, they'll tell you anything you want. You want me to go to church? I'll go to church. But it's phony, and when you get married, all of a sudden in six weeks, they're never in church. Because we sometimes see what we want to see, not what we should see. Are you listening this morning? The command, ladies, is to subject yourselves to your husband in everything. It's the willingness to relinquish your rights to submit under your husband. I've asked the Holy Spirit today, I, I'm not here to beat you women up. I'm not here to just chastise you. I'm here to plead with you and beg with you to listen to the Lord through the scriptures. Can this be a difficult command to follow? Yes. Number one, you've got flesh. And let me tell you something about your flesh, ladies. You don't want anybody governing you about anything. Because neither does your husband. Neither do I. We all answer to, to authority. And, and let's face it, sometimes we get aggravated when they try to tell us what to do. we got to battle our own flesh. Ladies, today you're going to walk out of here and you're going to make a decision. Do I want to be wise and honor Christ or do I want to be foolish? And when the storms come, because they're going to come, our house won't make it. And we'll be looking around at all of the scattered pieces of a broken life and say, how did we get here? I'm telling you how. And you're not immune. You won't escape the storms. Well, we've been married four years and it's nothing but bliss. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. You won't escape the storms. They're going to come, and they're going to come in all types of shades and packages. And some are going to blindside you and blast you. It's a hard command to follow sometimes. And listen, ladies, let me say it for you. Our husbands make it really hard. They're not loving me like Christ loved the church. They're not laying their life down for me. They're not serving me. They're not learning me. They just want me to wash their clothes, put food on the table, take care of the kids while they do their own thing. Men, sometimes we make it extremely difficult for our ladies to submit because of our actions. And I hate it when I see it because it breaks my heart because that man does not realize. Like, when couples come to me, I'll have them read this. This text, the whole thing. And I'll say, tell me what you learned. And undoubtedly, the man always says, she's supposed to submit to me. And a woman always says, he's supposed to love me like Christ loved the church. And pastor, he ain't loving me like that. Listen, you will never change as, if, as long as your focus is the other person. You know what I never do in counseling? Try to fix the party that's not there. Sometimes people get aggravated. I can't fix someone who's not here. Let's talk about you. Let's, let's deal with you. Let's see where you're at with Christ. Because ladies, this command is not a suggestion. It's a command of God. He made marriage. He instituted. He's the architect. And they labor in vain who build the house without the Lord at the center. And I know you can say, well, I know lost people got great marriages. Stay tuned, and maybe they'll be great up until they die and they perish. How?
How are we going to do this, ladies, when our husbands are less than? How are you going to do it? Look at Ephesians 5, 22. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. Paul gives the key to overcoming the wife's own flesh and the imperfect character of her husband when he puts on there in verse 22, as to the Lord, ladies willingly submitting to your husbands, even in all their imperfections, is in fact submitting to the Lord. And I've had to counsel women, yes, yes, your husband right now is currently constructed, is messed up. He is. I can't lie. He is. Everything you're telling me is disaster. But here's the thing. The command doesn't change. It doesn't change. How are you going to obey the command in light of the lack of character of your husband? Here's how. You ready? You're going to subject yourself to your husband as to the Lord. What that means is this. I'm going to look past the imperfections of my husband to the Lord. My husband might not be worthy of my subjection, but the Lord is. My husband might not be worthy of me submitting myself under his leadership, but the Lord is. And the Holy Spirit in his infinite godly wisdom knew that what he was going to have to tell wives sometimes is sometimes, ladies, get your focus off your husband onto the Lord. Are you listening to me? Because you will get no pass from God for disobeying this no matter what kind of husband you have. You're responsible to God. That's why I tell single people, man, you can't go into marriage lightly, man, especially if you're a woman. You have no idea what you're subjecting yourself to. This man's not leading you in Bible study. If this man's not hungry for the Lord, if this man's not trying to order his life after the, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, he is not worthy of your love. And I don't care what else he's got. Because all of that will disappear eventually. You know, the burps that you chuckle at will become an irritant. I've seen it a million times. It's not cute after a while. And then I got to look at wives and say, You made this decision. You ignored the counsel of God's word, and now you're in a house being built on sand. And I hate it for you. And it's miserable, and I know it is. And sometimes as I'm giving you this counsel, my flesh wants to say, run! Hit him in the head with a frying pan. You think I'm joking? I'm serious. Sometimes my flesh... Then I got to look at her with all the tenderness possible and say, but whatever he is does not exonerate you from obeying the command. And sometimes the only way you're going to obey this command well is by shifting your attention from the man to the Lord. I can do this for the Lord. Colossians 3.17 says this, Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Whatever you do in word or deed. Now, that's not a marriage passage, but it is, isn't it? Whatever you do in word or deed towards your husband, towards your wife, towards your kids, towards your employer. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says this. Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, ladies and gentlemen, your marriage fits in that whatever you do. Do all to the glory of the Lord. Do all to the glory of, the Lord, of God. 
We've seen the command. We've seen that the focus has got to be on Christ, not the husband. I want you to see something positive. The, the third thing I want you to see is the privilege associated with the command. Notice verses 32 and 33, how Paul wraps this up about husbands and wives. He says this. He says, this mystery is great. What mystery? Everything he's been talking about, husbands and wives. And he calls it a mystery. He said, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. You see, that whole metaphor that Paul's giving the marriage is not husbands and wives. They're the metaphor for Christ and the church. Do you get that? Everything you read there is so that you will understand better the bridegroom who is Christ and his bride, the church. But then he says this in verse 33. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. So what Paul is saying here is, look, what I've been talking about, this whole husband-wife stuff, I'm using it as a metaphor for Christ and his bride because Christ and his bride can't be seen. He's let, the Holy Spirit, through Paul, is letting us know the way that the bride of Christ, the church, and Christ interact, the marriage becomes an example of that relationship. Okay, if that's true, then ladies, who are you representing in your marriage? It's right in the text. Answer me. Who are you representing in the text? Who? What? Church. You and your marriage are representing the church, the body of Christ, not the, the physical church, because not everyone in the church is of Christ, but the ecclesia of God, those that have been called, chosen, and, and, uh, and, 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 and sanctified. Ladies, you represent the church. The, your responsibility in your marriage goes far beyond you and your husband. You are a representative of the bride of Christ to an entire world. So when you go to work and your, and your girlfriends know that your husband stinks and you submit anyhow and those girlfriends are asking you, what on earth are you doing? Cassie, I'm not saying. Trudy, yeah, I know, I shouldn't call people out. Cassie's great, Mary's great. Trudy, why are you submitting to Jim? He's a jerk. And what does Trudy say? She's going to tell him that because of the gospel, because of the work of Christ for her, in her, to her, she's in this marriage to not only honor Christ, but to show a lost world the very bride of church. Of Christ, Because, ladies, when you subject yourself to your husband, it's as to the Lord. In other words, when you submit to his leadership, you are submitting to the Lord. Why? Because the church should submit to the Lord. The church should obey the Lord. The church should follow after the Lord. And you now, in your marriage as Christians, you are a representative of the church. I don't know what that does for you. I know what it does for me when I read it and I understand it. It, it, it. it takes it to a whole new level. And men, let me say this to you. Do you know who you represent in this text, in your marriage? Who do you represent? The Lord. It took a woman to say it. All the other men are just hushed. Men, we are the representative person to the lost world of Christ. What a privilege. What a responsibility. It's both things. It's what a privilege. What a responsibility. How I treat Trudy is either going to point people to the gospel or it's going to take them away from it. Man, I hope that is just absolutely burned into your souls who you represent. You say, well, okay, but I don't even know. My advice is read the four Gospels. 
to know how Jesus interacted with the world. Listen, you represent him in your marriage to the world, to your kids. You want your kids to operate well in their marriage? They need to see it in your marriage. Amen. Ladies, if you don't submit well, they won't submit well. And then you're teaching them to sin. And probably a very broken life. What a privilege for both husband and wife to be used of God to display the union between Christ and church. But Paul does say, nevertheless, even though this is what I'm really speaking about, what I've taught about husbands and wives is still true. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, respect your husbands. It's just interesting that the husband isn't taught to respect his wife. And the wife isn't being told there to love her husband. And after 30 years of counseling, I can tell you why. Men are not good at loving well. Certainly not the way of Christ, which is to lay our lives down. We've been taught to be macho, and I'm certainly not telling you not to be a man. But a man of God lays his life down for his wife. And wives... Some of you have passed your husbands in degrees. Trudy's got two. I got one. Some of you have passed your husband in money making. I've told Trudy our 40 years, make all the money you want. I'll have, I will not feel threatened by that at all. Listen, ladies, I know how bad we men can be. And yet here's Paul saying, respect your husband. Amen. And you know, I, I know Trudy loves me. But if I didn't think I had her respect, it would crush my world. Now ask me, am I always worthy of it? Nope. Nope. No, I'm not. But she gives it anyhow. And I told you all a million times, I try to love my wife better each day of my life, learn her better, know her better, serve her better. It matters to me. I understand I'm representing Christ in my marriage. And I get really frustrated with myself if I forget to set her coffee pot. She always tries to let me, I'll talk, it's no big deal. No, it is a big deal. That's what I do for you. I sneak back at six, between 6 p.m. and 7 and turn the covers down like it's a Hilton. Now, has God called me to turn down covers and set coffee pots? In a way, yes, I'm called to serve my wife. Finally, the fourth point is this, the intended result of obedience. Notice 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Ladies, our purpose as blood-bought children of God is to bring glory to God by living for him in obedience to his commands. That's why we were created. Isaiah 43, 7 says that everyone who's called by my name, if you're a child of God, you've been called by his name, and whom I've created for my glory and recreated through Christ for his glory, whom I have formed, even I've made. You are here to glorify God. You are not here for yourself. You're not here to live for yourself. You're here to live for God. We're to live to bring glory to God. So what we say matters, what we do matters, what we don't say matters, what we don't do matters. And I'm heartbroken that the church in large doesn't seem to care. Some of you will leave here today and be unchanged. And I don't get it. I don't. And I wonder, are they even yours, Lord? Can they hear this and walk out and ignore it? 
William McDonald says this, women who leave their God-appointed sphere can wreck a local church, break up a marriage, and destroy a home. On the other hand, there is nothing more attractive than a woman fulfilling the role that God has assigned her. These are not merely Paul's words. They are the words of God. To refuse them is to refuse God and to invite difficulty and disaster. And ladies, some of you made the choice to marry an unsaved man. Which you blew it. Now, now you're married. Let's get him saved. Amen. Let's pray for his soul. And ladies, the way to do it is not to nag him. I've never known a man to change through nagging. Really, I've never known a man to change. Oh, you might nag him to church, but he's sitting here and he's fishing in his mind. Well, what are we going to do? He's lost. How can I submit to him? How can I subject myself to him? He's lost. He doesn't know Jesus. And by the way, he doesn't even care about Jesus. And yeah, I know now, Pastor, I probably shouldn't have married him, but isn't that too late? What do I do now? Easy. Obey God. Subject yourself to your husband. 1 Peter 3, 1, 2 says this. In the same way, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. When you submit to that lost husband, God will use your submission quite possibly to draw your husband to salvation. Maybe not at first, and maybe he's going to abuse it and take advantage of it. So what do I do? Submit. I've been doing that for six months, preacher, and nothing's happened. What do I do now? Submit. It's been five years. What do I do now? Submit. You see, the command, ladies, isn't based on the worthiness of your husband. Amen. The command is to submit to him as if it was the Lord. And if it was the Lord you were married to, you'd submit. And you'd willingly do it because he bled and died and gave his life for you. Well, Paul's saying, ladies, that's exactly how you ought to operate with your man who's representative of Christ. As they observe your chaste and respectful, that they might be one without a word. In other words, ladies, you might not be able to, don't paste scripture all around the house and in his car six places. And uh huh, what? I don't know, what? No, 1 Peter 3, you know what it says? Don't even, don't even do that. Live the word before him. And by doing that, you give room for the Holy Spirit to bring conviction upon his soul. And if you'll do that, 1 Peter tells us they may be one, and the one there is the gospel. They may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives. And ladies, the men you struggle to submit to because they are not what they should be can be won to Christ through your submission. So hang in and hang on. And I, 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 don't, I don't wish your life. I, I'm sorry. It breaks my heart. I wish you had a great marriage. I wish your husbands loved you like Christ loved the church and was laying his life down for the church. I wish you had that. And I don't know if you'll ever have it. But none of that excuses whether or not you obey this command. Amen. Remember in the garden when they blew it? Eve was deceived and ate, gave to her husband, and he ate. And then, you know, God came in the cool of the day, and they're hiding behind a bush naked because that's what sin does. It causes you to want to hide from God. God asked Adam, where are thou? And he wasn't asking as if he didn't know because God knows everything. The question he was asking Adam wasn't where are you physically? Do you know what you've done? 
And then a God pronounced judgment, didn't he? He started with the man. And the man, you know, when I was a young Christian, I used to think that Adam was trying to blame Eve. He really wasn't. He was blaming God. It's the woman you gave me. In other words, if you hadn't created her, she couldn't have been deceived. If she wasn't deceived, I wouldn't have ate. It's not really my fault that I chose sin. But did God judge him? And then the woman comes along. And you know what she says? Hey, it's not my fault. It's the serpent's fault. He tricked me. Did God judge her? And the servant looked around and said, oops. You and you alone are responsible for your life. How you're going to live it. What choices you're going to make. Who are you going to follow? Who are you going to obey? Ladies, submit first to Christ, then to your husbands, and pray for your husbands. Pray for their weaknesses. Compliment their strength. Because men need to feel respected. So compliment them anywhere you can. And submit. Be gracious in the submission. You never know if you'll trust God and obey His word. You just might be the catalyst that saves your husband. And I've seen that over and over and over again. You say, well, how long? Well, the Israelites waited 400 years to be rescued from Egypt. I don't know how long, and it's not, I can't tell you it's 400 years. And by the way, ladies, I can't promise you he, he's ever going to change. I'm not God. I can't know that. But I know you can either represent Christ in a way that will maybe draw him to Christ, but if you fight his flesh with your flesh, your marriage has no shot and you have no shot. I love you. Thank you for braving this. If you need any discussion further, certainly my name, my phone number, my email will be up there. But if we're going to talk, we're going to use the Word of God. Because it's the Word that God says He'll bless. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I love you. I thank you for this church. I thank you for those that have gathered in your name for your glory today. I thank you for our praise team that leads us in musical worship. I thank you for Dan and Dana who willingly bring donuts on the first Sunday. And it's an act of service and worship. And I thank you, Lord, for those that give faithfully to this church. I thank you, Lord, for the husbands and wives that are doing it right. I thank you, for, Lord, for the husbands that do it right if the wives don't and the wives that do it right if the husband doesn't. I thank you, Lord, for the courage it takes to follow you. But, Lord, you have placed within us your spirit so that we do have the power needed to obey you. The question is whether we'll crucify our flesh in order to do so. Bless this day, Lord. Fill these singers tonight and musicians with an unction from above. May your glory fill that building as we worship you tonight. We pray all this in Jesus' name and amen.